reached 11 years old. Um, but the subject of how that remit regulation, and in particular it's Article 5, impacts on identifying and dealing with artificial pricing, prices that are this, that emerge through market manipulation, is something that uh, we looked at at the FSR when we were still allowed to meet in person, which seems many, many moons ago, but in fact was only just over a year ago. Uh, we had a very interesting debate on the subject and we've actually managed to get um, a number of speakers um, who were present um, at that time back on the panel today to consider, well, we're a year and a half further, um, do we have clearer guidance um, on how we apply the remit rules to identify artificial pricing. Uh, not only do we have a lineup um, based on uh, the participation in that earlier seminar, but we're very lucky today to have Guillaume with us from Simmons and Simmons. And he's going to talk about a very recent case uh, where the rules have been applied in Spain. Uh, so we can reflect on how much guidance is emerging at national level as well. So I think uh, we can kick off. Alberto, did you want to say any words yet? Um, no, I think you introduced the topic and uh, I think we better um, leave as much time as possible to, to the substance of this debate. So I think, um, why don't you go ahead okay. and start with the proceedings. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to all of you also from my side. Please leave. Thank you. And please feel free to post questions in the chat and we will, we will monitor the chat as well to uh, pass the questions on to speakers and participants. So um, I'd like to invite our first speaker today, Martin Gottfried from Acer, um, who is head of uh, surveillance um, at and market, um, I've got to market, and mar surveillance and market committee um, at Acer. And he has been very much involved in this subject. It's very dear to his heart, I think it's fair to say. So, Martin, the screen is yours. Um, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Exactly. So, <clears throat> Dave, uh, Alberto, thank you very much for inviting me and for organizing this interesting debate. Uh, oh, yet to be proven to be interesting, but I'm quite sure the topic is interesting enough to become interesting with such a delightful group of speakers. I am trying now to do something exactly what I did before. It's going with, of course, always tricky that if it has to happen, then it, then it goes, of course, slowly. Um, so do we see anything on your side? Could you, I um, cannot see Martin, anymore. Martin, unfortunately, you will have to do it again. Okay. Thank you. We saw the slides for a moment. And oh, maybe and you just click things. on stop sharing by mistake. It was the bar uh, close yeah, to the zone. I, I think I think I made this error myself. I think you're right. One second. Instead, you could two. you could click on hide next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, you're absolutely right. Sorry for this clumsiness. No problem. Um, Don't worry. As long as I'm... <clears throat> always exciting to get these things working at the moment that they need to be working. Um, why is it not allow me to click on share now? That's the question. Um, is it? No, you should be able to. And it comes once. Oh second. yeah, 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 it comes. It comes. Wait, sorry, wait, sorry. Wait. Yes, yes, it comes. Here we are. And that, there yeah, it is. Yeah, it oh, comes. I deeply apologize for this. No worries. Perfect. Perfect. So, Absolutely. I have been asked by Alberto and they to come up with some insights on artificial prices and on the remit, and let me jump in. Uh, right on the topic to explain how I thought I'm going to organize my, my slides with you. Short, uh, after introduction, I will go to the notion of artificial prices on the remit. Then I will also allude a little bit to securing of an artificial prices. It's, I think, an important phenomenon there. Then I come up with an example in line with our guidance that we issued on the updated guidance, I should say, on the 1st of May this year. And I end with some final comments. Now, for most of you who are maybe not so familiar with the remit as I am, um, I would like to focus today on the so-called on-market manipulation, where you require to have a completion of a transaction of an order by a market participant on a wholesale energy product to potentially breach remit, where uh, in my view, and I made it a bit uh, gray to focus on the words that are important. On the one hand side, you have the false or misleading signals, 
and artificial uh, level of a price. I will not go into all the other things. There are many things other in Remit, but I want to focus here and bring this to your attention by saying to you, uh, by providing you an answer on the question, have there been a lot of cases on the application of the artificial price level, uh, let's say uh, leg of the uh, Remit Article 2? And I can tell you that they have, but by national regulatory authorities for energy, they have, but very often actually only also with the uh, in, parallel, uh, in parallel, the application of the false or misleading signals. What you see from my perspective when NRAs apply the regulation of Remit on the market prohibition on market abuse, they are often using the false or misleading signals. Um, perhaps it's easier, and therefore maybe it's also interesting to have this debate today because artificial price are a bit more complicated. And I know only of one court case from the financial regulators, regulators, which is also mentioned on the bottom of the slide I have here. It's a, a, um, a minute short percentage. Well, C4509, it is actually by, it was a Dutch case. Um, there, it was more about the price level. I have an extra slide in the back of my presentation where we can jump to it, but for the sake of time, I would like to go on and then go immediately to the notion of artificiality on the remit. Um, I, I mean, essentially what it is, is that if there's a price level prevailing um, as a result of um, not competitive, non-interplay between supply and demand, then it may reflect an artificial price. So when normally prices are the result of a fair and competitive interplay between supply and demand, then we are are talking about a reflection of a price resulting of market fundamentals, and then it is a it is a um, an artificial price if it's not at that level. Now, I'm not having focused in this presentation today on the level itself, but to be very clear, the artificiality of a price level, it level the height of itself, the level itself, can be uh, low, can be high, it can be reflecting the price level of an hour before or a week before. It, that is not the issue. It is really, it is artificial if it's not the result of market fundamentals. And what we write in the Asia guidance is that you could apply the counterfactual when an NRA is going to apply this provision and assess in a specific case, whether there was a, there was a artificial price level, uh, then the counterfactual reasoning could be applied. Artificial price can occur at different times of behavior, different different types of behavior. It can be the result of a wash trade. It can be the result of marking the close or the reference period. It can be the result of prearrangement or trades or capacity withholding. Um, to give you a concrete example, there was the NG case in 2019 by Ofgem put forward where NG was actually reaching price at the price of an artificial price level uh, was deemed by UK, by the UK author authority here, uh, Ofgem. But I must say at the same time, in that case, they applied also the provision of misleading signals. So um, it, was, it was a tandem, but they really focused on, on the um, misleading signals element of the remit uh, provisions. Now, the other element I would like to briefly touch upon before I go to the example is the securing of an artificial price level. I think it's important to mention because it's also part of the provision. I think, uh, to make it very short, the way I see it is that Remit really requires uh, the provision to be applied that there should be a, at least a partial causality between the, let's say, range of actions that the market participant has executed in order to bring the price at an artificial price level. And that's, a, I think, a very strong uh, strategic uh, straight thing that you, you need to really have this partial causality. Um, it should be you should show that it was really because of the successful set of actions by this market participant that the price were secured at this artificial price level. Partially causality, not fully, but partially, I would say. And then um, we go to the example um, where I uh, bring to your attention the ASA guidance that I already mentioned it was updated on the 11th of May. Uh, um, with this slide, I, I don't have a lot of time, so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page 
when we're talking about capacity withholding and starting to embark on it from an artificial price perspective. So uh, very brief, we're talking about here in this example on an wholesale power market, they had uh, pay as bid if you like, it's an auction market. And then they are in this scheme, usually um, start, it starts again here with, of course, the assumption that uh, the price, if it's the result of a fair and competitive interplay of supply and demand and absent of market failures, then the clearing price will depend on the adequacy or inadequacy available to generation capacity. And the next two bullet points, not to spend too much time because I sort of assume that everybody's comfortable, familiar with it, um, is that if you are in a situation where you have hours of adequacy, then there's an infra marginal rent to be taken by those technologies who are dispatched. And these rents can contribute, of course, also to the recovery of fixed costs. And in times of inadequacy, then the price will meet the level of the value of last load. And then there will also be a legitimate rent for also to be used as fixed cost. I hope that it's OK for you that I quickly went through that slide to gain some time. And then we go to the actual capacity withholding where it becomes um, capacity of holding as the behavior itself. And here I, 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 I have quoted, I can quote the ASI guidance, but uh, what we have here is in a competitively setting uh, scenario, um, if you are not offering your, in this case, generation capacity to the market in a competitive way, whereas if they would have had done that, you would have a profitable transaction uh, against the prevailing market prices, then we consider that capacity withholding as itself as a behavior, which can be done in physical withholding and economic withholding. Now, it's very clear that capacity withholding uh, does not automatically render into a breach of Article 5 of Remit. It must be very care carefully assessed um, based on a case-by-case -case analysis, where the many specificities of a certain case in certain circumstances must be taken into account whether, for example, it's an auction market or continuous market or whether different time frames or type of marketplaces. These are just a few examples of what I mentioned here, but it must be a case by case analysis. When then market manipulation, sorry, apologize, when then capacity withholding turns manipulative, if you I argue, the ASA guidance uh, brings these further points forward. And here we are in a situation, again, case specific circumstances, where uh, the essentially the market participant has a specific position, let's say pivotal supplier position, when it engages in such a behavior. So it is pivotal and it does physical or economic withholding. That's the first, let's say, step in the analysis. And the second step would be that uh, there will be no uh, legitimate technical, regulatory, economic justifications for its behavior when it's being prompted to, of course, argue and uh, explain its case, uh, when it does not offer generation capacity uh, offered above its marginal cost, including opportunity costs. So when it's not offering generation capacity at all, or when it offers it economically withholding above the marginal cost, including an opportunity cost, then you get to the point that it's manipulative capacity withholding. And I must say, um, jump immediately forward to say to you that the way the agency uh, rather novelty applied uh, here in the guidance opportunity cost concept, it's, uh, it's brave in the sense that it's not a straightforward concept. So if you ask me, is that that's easy? No, that is not. But it, it is, it is, it is uh, quite different from a competition law where I will not go into now. But it's, uh, you could ask questions about concept of opportunity cost. And I want to what they say in the Netherlands, cut the grain before your feet, before you ask the question, because it's true, it's complicated. And then um, my final considerations that I would like to share with you, I would like to really make clear that Remit does not say anything about the level of uh, price that you have to offer. Right? There is not a certain price foreseen by Remit, uh, provided that the price reflects a fair and competitive interplay. And then the benefiting position for me is a very important one. It's, it's not only behavior and the two steps I just explained earlier, but you know to also argue that the, let's say in civil words, uh, undue profits that have been gained through this benefiting position should be explained as well. For example, because 
you've been able to raise prices in the market for the benefit of power plants that are already running and from which you extract these higher profits or the artificially raised prices in other markets or in connection to a financial position that you have as a market participant in other position. And then I think remit applies not only in uh, electric generation capacity, it's irrespective of competition law. So I, I, I read up loud here that irrespective of competition law, uh, it of course is applied. Um, yeah, final point from my side, market participants should be able to recover their fixed cost, as I mentioned earlier, for, for, through, for example, infer marginal rents, but there's no guarantee that they should. That is it from my side, what I've prepared for today for you. I will stop presenting and then lay the floor is back to you, I guess. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. That was an excellent, very clear presentation of what we know to be uh, an extremely complex uh, subject. So I think you've set down some interesting terms for debate um, to take up with the panel shortly. But let's now turn to how the Spanish um, regulatory authority has recently applied these rules um, with its decision uh, that came out in April of this year. And we're very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Guillermo uh, from Simmons & Simmons. Uh, he is a lawyer specializing in energy law issues. And uh, Guillermo, the screen is now yours. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try to, to share my screen. Now, working okay, now. Know. Okay. Perfect. Let me try one second, please. Okay, um, thank you very much, Lee and Alberto, and good afternoon to everyone from Madrid, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this debate. Uh, okay, in the following slides, slides I, I, and in around 10 minutes, I'm going to explain the recent sanctioning resolution issued by the Spanish Commission Market and Competition, that is the CNMC, the, the Spanish authority, in the procedure initiated against the company Rock Trading World SA for uh, manipulation and attempted manipulation of the organized gas market between days 3 and 7 of November uh, 2000, 2018. Okay, in order to explain the case and to contextualize my presentation, uh, I want to quickly explain in this uh, first slide how uh, the gas and electricity markets are organized in Spain because uh, is in these markets uh, where compliant compliance with remit regulation is required uh, in relation to the artificial price. We have in Spain one electricity market that is structured in different supermarket also, uh, the daily market, the intraday auction market, and the continuous uh, intraday market, and in which OMIA is the market operator, the NIMO, that manages the platform from these electricity markets. And on the other hand, we have uh, in Spain, the Iberian gas market, MIPGAS, which is also comprised uh, different uh, submarkets like the spot uh, MIPGAS uh, derivatives spot and also MIPGAS derivatives uh, forward or futures. MIPGAS SA is the market operator that manages the platform uh, for this gas, for this gas uh, market. The, okay, the non-compliance with remit regulation analyzed in the CNC re, uh, resolution took place on the on this on MIF gas market. Uh, for for this reason, uh, we focus on MIF gas market, but uh, it is important to know that the regulation in the electricity market is similar in terms of uh, market manipulation conduct. Okay. Focusing on MIF gas, which uh, I say is the market affected in this case, the following are the main features. 
Midgas is a recent market. The, plus, the platform for, for transaction started its activity in December 2015. And uh, as you can see uh, from the figures, the volume traded has been increasing every year with the exception of 2020, for which for no reasons is an, ex an exceptional uh, year, uh, also in this case. And also the number of registered brokers to trade in this market has been increasing every year uh, uh, reaching a number of 144 in 2000, 2020. The MIFGAS implementations follows the principles set out in ACER and in the European gas market model. And uh, different products can be traded on MIFGAS plat platform like a virtual valency point product, virtual valency tank, uh, virtual valency storage and also virtual trading points uh, also with with Portugal. Okay, now that we are familiar with the the affected market uh, with Midgas, the actors involved in these uh, resolutions were uh, Rock Trading SA, that is uh, the infringer, and the CNMC as the regulatory authority. Uh, okay, Rock Trading is a global company, uh, maybe you know, with presence in, uh, on the five continents, continents in both electricity and gas market in the trading activities. And in Europe, uh, Rock Trading is one of the main energy trading companies. And uh, in Spain, Rock Trading started its activity in MIFGAS on 2 November uh, 2018. And this is important because, uh, as we will see, uh, the fact of uh, which was investigated uh, rock trading took place on days 3 to 7 November uh, 2018. Uh, on the other hand, we have the CNMC that comprises six supervisory authorities, maybe you know, the National Competition, the National Energy Commission, the Telecommunication Commission, the National Post Sector, and the Audiovisual Council Railway and Airport Regulation Committee. The CNMC is responsible uh, for ensuring transparency and fair, and fair competition in the electricity and gas sector, and therefore uh, in those markets, including the level of the wholesale price and also ensuring that uh, gas and electricity companies comply with transparency obligations. In the uh, energy market, uh, the participants uh, like Rock Trading must be registered before the CNMC. So uh, the CNMC is the, the regulator in this case. Okay, following this introduction, let's get into the content of the resolution. As I, as I said before, Rock Trading starts its activity in MIFGAS on 2 November 2018. And the purpose of the sanctioning procedure was to determine if between days 3 to 7 of November 2018, the following infringements were committed by rock trading. The first one, uh, if rock trading carry out transactions that could provide false or misleading indications as to the supply of the wholesale energy products, and in particular to determine if uh, rock trading include, included sell bids for a very small volume at a price lower than what the trading platform was showing at the time of the sell site. On the other hand, uh, if rock trading set the price of a wholesale energy product at an artificial level. Okay, in this context, uh, what were the facts investigated by the CMC in the resolution? In this slide, I have tried to summarize the trading activity of rock trading in MIFGAS during the days 3 to 7 November uh, 2018. That was investigated by the CNMC. There are four kinds of transactions that referred uh, to in the resolutions involving different products traded on MIFGAS that were analyzed. In the first one, there are several products affected in two days on 3 November 2018 for the product D plus two. That means a product with settlement on 5 November. Rock Trading submitted sales offers for a reduced volume of 10, 7, and 3 megawatts a day at the price of 25 euros. Thereafter, on 5 November for the intraday product, Rock Trading made a purchase offers that was matched for uh, 100 megawatts a day at the price of 24.87 megawatts euros. 
In addition to this, on the other hand, on 5 November, Rock Trading executed the last, the last sale transactions one second before of the closing. That marked the last price uh, on the trading session of the intraday product of the continuous market that day. Uh, the, the volume was uh, 14 megawatts at price of 23.45 euros. That means that means lower than the MIPGAS uh, daily reference for this product uh, that was 24.77. The third trading action I investigated refers to the intraday product traded on 6 November. That day, Rock Trading Inter uh, three and 10 megawatts a day, that means uh, small volumes, at a price between 23.50 and 24.67 megawatts hour, all of which were lower than those that it was uh, binding. And the last action investigated in accordance with the resolution took place in relation to the intraday product on 7 November 2018, on that day, Rock Trading introduced sale bids for a reduced volume at price lower than those executed by other agents in previous transactions to subsequently make purchase bids for high volumes at price between 25.85 and 25.95 euros. Okay, the CNFC resolution does not establish a detailed analysis of the limit that we can consider as price set an artificial level, but analyze the offers and transactions carried out by, by rock trading that lead it to conclude that the price were artificial. As is established in the resolution, rock trading set price at, at an artificial level on 5 November 2018 by establishing the last day price in the intraday product at a lower price than the, that this day. On the other hand, rock trading provides false or misleading indication as to the supply, demand, or price of wholesale products on the days 3, 5, 7, uh, 6, and 7 of November 2018. In another precedent, a uh, recent precedent uh, of remit manipulation, MIPGAS, in MIPGAS, dated of 18 November 2018, the CMC did include a reference of what it considered to be artificial price such as those found in the OTC market at a level which was not in the line with the market. This was the explanation in that case. In this occasion, the resolution published a graph to represent the evolution of the, of the MIFGAS index and prices. Okay. Uh, going back to the resolution the, that we are analyzing, in relation to the arguments used by rock trading as defense, I think that uh, these are, all of these are really good uh, arguments that uh, can be uh, remarkable and comprehensive. Rock trading uh, justify the legality of these uh, transactions with the following arguments. The event that motivated the resolution took place in the first week of rock trading activity in MIFGAS. It is thereof argued that these operations were rather test uh, of the company's operations. Rock Trading argued that these reasons why uh, they, he introduced a small volume sales trade that was because it was the first week of trading MIPGAS and it wanted volume sales to test the functioning of the market. Secondly, from the moment that Rock Trading started its activity operation in the market, respected the rules without any remarkable incident. Thirdly, before the sanctioning of the, pro of the pro procedure initiated, Rock Trading had a meeting with the MIPGAS staff to clarify what type of trading operation could be carried out on MIPGAS. And the last two arguments were that uh, there was not public evidence of market manipulation. If uh, anything, it could be said to be attempted to manipulate the market. And in addition, rock trading considered that there was not also a tempest manip to manipulate the market, either since the market could not have been endangered with, with such an, an insignificant volume offered. Okay, in re uh, having analyzed the fact of the case, uh, what does the law in Spain say about the infringement of the remit regulations? Or in other words, what is the infringement that the remit, remit regulation can be committed in MIPGAS? According to Article 110, uh, 
point yield of your carbon law will be considered service infringements involving a fine up to 6 million euros, then no compliance by obligated parties with European Union's regulation and decisions applicable to them in the hydrocarbon sector. And in particular, any infringement for uh, manipulation or attempted manipulation of the market using privileged information or failure to disseminate privileged informations in accordance to the provisions uh, of the remit regulations. So uh, on the basis of the fact analyzed, the arguments of defense and the applicable law that we have seen, the CMC resolutions considered that Brock Trading committed the following infringements. Lawyering, that is the introduction of false or misleading trading sig signals about the price trends to, of the product. In this case, Rock Trading includes, includes its offer on the sell side with the intention of executing traders on the buy side as an attempt to manipulate the market, marking the close, executing the last sale transaction that marks the last uh, daily price for an artificial low price of the trading session of the intraday continuous market for product that day. And the last one, Momentum Ignition, providing offers to sell gas at low prices for small volumes that introduce downward pressure on the selling price and generate downward price trend for other agents to follow. All of these categories mentioned involve the following infringements. Market manipulation by issuing an order to trade in Walter Energy products whereby price are set or uh, attempted to be set at an artificial prices and attempted manipulation, attempted market manipulation that requires the placing of any other to trade in wholesale product with the intent to fix the price and artificial level or to provide misleading indication to supply demand or price of the product. Okay, this uh, just to, to, to see uh, an overview, as you know, this, all of these categories are include, uh, are in accordance with the articles five uh, 2.2 and 2.3 of the remit regulation that established the, the prohibition of the manipulation or attempted manipulation of the wholesale markets with the terms that, uh, that you know, uh, that you can see in these slides. And uh, in conclusion, uh, rock trading, according to the CNMC, committed the following infringements. Fixing the price, the final price of the intraday product on 5 November, by uh, marking the close, which con constitute a market manipulations in accordance uh, with the article 2.2 and introducing false or misleading signals about the price trend of the product on the side of the bid book. For this action, uh, uh, a fine of 6,000 euros was, was imposed, which can be considered quite low, taking into account that the maximum possible fine according to the article 110 of the hydrocarbons law, as we said before, is up to 6 million euros. And in addition, rock trading received a reduction of 3% so that it finally paid 48,000 euros. As uh, to finish my presentation, uh, the, la the last considerations, in my opinion, uh, it is quite reasonable to think that a uh, transaction of road trade in emit gas those days was due to his inexperience in this market. It is also reasonable to think that this inexperience was one of the reasons why rock trading offered reduced uh, volumes. It is normal that uh, during this, during uh, the first days, uh, trading companies make tests on the market in order to know how uh, works the the market and how they can they can do in the in this market. However, the lack of experience is not a reason to allow an infringement of the remit regulations. So it is normal also that the CMC uh, start this, this procedure in order to determine the, the sanction. And it is also remarkable the sensitive sensitivity in the variation of the price considered by the CMC to, to determine that we are in the case, in a case of artificial price. And um, finally, uh, in the case of violation of, of remit regulation, MIFGAS, uh, in MIFGAS, the CMC was a wide margin of discretion to graduate penalties uh, from one euro to six millions. And this not uh, is the same in the electric market in which the, 
the minimum uh, penalty is uh, 600,000 euros. So this is a, a difference important between both markets in Spain. So I think that this is all. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for an excellent presentation and uh, for a very clear um, way of uh, putting over what was a complex uh, series of actions um, and highlighting some of the important um, elements in the case. Um, I didn't actually realize that that was Rock, uh, Rock Trade's first day of trading um, <laughs> on the market, so <laughs> probably they weren't expecting uh, to close the day in such a fashion. Um, now, before we turn to questions uh, from the audience, uh, we have um, a very distinguished panel of um, experts with us um, to comment on the subject of artificial pricing and their, in their views on whether we do have clearer guidance, perhaps whether if that was the case, rock trade would have been prevented from doing what they did on that first day of trading. So I'd like to turn first, uh, if I may, to Fabian, um, Fabian Rock, uh, who is um, a member here of the Florence School of Regulation, as well as um, being partner at Compass uh, Lexicon and um, has worked extensively on remit matters. Thank you, Fabian. Well, thank you, Lee. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, very happy to be here and to comment on a topic I know uh, well. Um, I am um, both an academic and a practitioner. Um, as you said, Lee, um, as a colleague, it's very nice to be uh, you know, teaching and, and doing research at FSR, but I'm also, uh, as a practitioner, a consultant with Compass Lexicon. And it is in that capacity that I hope to share some of my experience working on remit cases uh, in the past few years. I have only three full slides, so I will be relatively brief in, in my comments. I just want to uh, perhaps uh, emphasize, um, well, first, uh, typically, how do we as economists uh, get involved in these cases? Because typically, I think there is both a, a legal dimension and uh, an eco economic dimension uh, on these issues. So, so my, my area of expertise in remit in the past, um, I would say five years has been uh, on a preemptive basis, working with a number of companies to review their trading activity practices. And I think it's not just about, you know, when you have an investigation, it's really also uh, putting in place the right uh, frameworks, the right practices so that you um, are obviously compliant. Uh, it's also about putting in place systems. So verification systems, uh, I would say cross checks from an economic point of view on the trading practices that ensure that you are compliant. And, and obviously there is a case of investigations, should there be one. But I think this is a, a brief introduction. And then on the typical prohibitions, I think Martin was very clear uh, in his presentation. So I won't say uh, a lot more, um, I just want to highlight that this is an area of relatively intense activity for uh, national regulatory authorities. We have had roughly about 100 cases, if not more, opened per year uh, in the past few years. So it is really um, obviously uh, uh, keeping a, a number of national regulatory authorities busy as well as, as others being involved. And I think Martin already mentioned that there are two main articles, uh, one on insider trading prohibition, Article 3, and Article 5 on market manipulation. So I think today we are focusing very much on, on you know, market manipulation and artificial prices. So I, I want to offer a few comments on that, on artificial prices. So um, there are a number of definitions, um, and in particular, ACER, has provided very useful guidance. Um, it's evolved over time. There are several editions. Uh, it's online, and, and I invite everybody to look at it. Uh, Martin already mentioned, uh, you know, these, these different points. I want to highlight um, 
that in addition to Acer, there have been a number of, um, I would say, guidelines or recommendations published by the different regulatory authorities. So, for instance, on electricity market abuse, I, I found the Benetza, uh, the German regulatory authority um, guidance, very useful. Uh, there is also, uh, I would say, guidance from some of the market operators themselves. So, Nordpool uh, has provided, for instance, very useful guidance on algorithmic trading. Uh, so, to answer one of your questions, Lee, uh, do we have a basis now, uh, I think, to, uh, to interpret Remit a bit more clearly? I would say it's not just case law, it's also the, the guidance, um, both from uh, you know, national regulatory agencies and, and, and from some of the stakeholders that's very useful here. Now, we also, I think, are starting to have a, a robust process as economists to, uh, to evaluate some of these alleged uh, manipulations. And here is just a chart that uh, represents what I've been applying in a number of cases. So you have on the left, the inputs that are needed. So as economists, what do we need to work? Well, we need data. We need market transaction data, but we also need information on the market fundamentals. Martin mentioned that obviously we need to understand the market fundamentals and whether the bids are in line with these fundamentals. So the starting point of any analysis is to have information on these two things. Um, then what do we do? Well, typically, and this is an example, uh, for instance, if um, the issue is a loss-making transaction um, withholding, for instance, of profitable capacity from the day ahead market, well, then you'll need to consider a number of analysis, establishing the impact on the price, establishing the payoff. So what there uh, an incentive or not for doing it from a, an economic point of view. And as Martin explained also, uh, comparing with a counterfactual scenario, so computing the damage uh, by comparing uh, what happened in reality with what would have happened uh, if um, essentially one had followed uh, the, the best practice. So in terms of indicators, there are numbers of uh, indicators uh, to be used. And uh, I'll come back to that in, in my next slide, which is my last slide. Um, so establishing market manipulation or artificial prices is actually not a straightforward exercise. I'm sure that must be obvious uh, to you by now, but it needs to be based on a robust economic assessment based on, on a set of uh, specific cumulative criteria. So it's not just one criteria, it typically is multidimensional. Um, importantly, my experience is that it should take into account the competitive incentives of market participants, which may legitimate trading behavior, which may look weird when you look at it without having the context, which provides actually a rational for this trading behavior. So things that need to be considered and have been indeed considered in some of these investigations include the market design, uh, we know that there are some specificities in the different member states, both for gas and electricity, and these may induce market participants to have a specific approach to bidding. What's also very important usually um, is to take into account the intertemporal uh, incentives. So if you look in isolation at what market, you may miss the fact that this market is linked to other markets in the chain. And that therefore, by isolating this market, you do not have a full picture of the opportunity costs. Um, so intermarket, intertemporal effects are, in my experience, essential in the remit investigations to understand whether there was a rational for the bid or not. And to give you a very concrete example in conclusion, uh, for instance, if you look at the electricity sector, and you look at generators, um, their bids in the day ahead market may actually be affected by incentives they have in subsequent markets. So in intraday, in reserves, in balancing, and therefore their bids may include not just direct production costs, uh, but also unit commitment constraints 
opportunity costs associated, for instance, uh, if they can store or delay production uh, in the case of hydro plants with uh, the use of water, opportunity costs associated with the operation in some of these subsequent markets, or simply premiums associated with some of the risks. And risk aversion is not the same for all market participants. So to conclude, uh, a case-by-case -case analysis is uh, necessary. And what needs to be taken into account is the specific local market rules and incentives that they induce for the market participants. So that concludes my talk. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, also for giving us that um, context at the end, I think maybe picking up on something also uh, that has been stressed, the specificities of each transaction and how perhaps that makes it difficult to give concrete guidance. Now, you, you mentioned uh, Nordpool, uh, that the market has given guidance. So I think that uh, is um, a good stepping stone uh, to turn now uh, to Camille Berg from Nordpool. Um, and we would like to welcome her back as well um, to an FSR event um, on this topic. Um, would you like to share your views with us, Camille? Yes, thank you for inviting me and thank you for Ma to Martin and Guillermo and Fabian for excellent uh, presentations. Um, I would just like to start with the obvious that uh, prices in electricity um, provides extremely valuable information. And for us as a power exchange, I think uh, we could even say it's our most valuable product. And that is why also the debate we're having here today is such an important debate because uh, artificial prices undermine uh, confidence in market signals and, uh, and market participants, they need to have confidence in prices. If they are unsure on whether the order book uh, reflects market fundamentals, um, they may lose confidence in the market and even withdraw from it. And, um, that's why we, it's so important that we uh, monitor this at all times. And, and then we come back to what is a genuine price or a non-artificial price. And um, Remit does not provide any definition of it, but it refers to it uh, in many places. And I agree also with what uh, Martin said that um, a genuine price is uh, the result of the interaction between supply and demand, and that is the outcome of the, fund the fundamental market situation. Um, and it's also important to emphasize here that it, we can have um, uh, we can have uh, extremely high or extremely low prices. Uh, if, the, if those prices reflect the fundamental uh, market situations, it can send important signal for operational or investment decisions. And it's not uh, artificial by, um, by being high or by being very high or very low. Uh, I think uh, that we could say that uh, every order that is placed in the market should be designed to be executed and uh, it should represent the real willingness uh, to trade. Um, uh, um, for example, in, in layering or spoofing, uh, the purpose of the orders is to affect the price development and not to fulfill those orders. And um, uh, uh, it was referred to uh, um, uh, publication we have done, and we have also done another publication on, on the Remit Best Practice Report, that is a sector re review on the Remit compliance, and in this report we highlight uh, the real desire to trade behind every order as a very uh, important compliance advice. So uh, if you then take the view that uh, the supply and demand should determine the genuine price, um, this can become very challenging, uh, for example, in the continuous power markets. The market spread evolves throughout the whole trading window, uh, sometimes with every new transaction even. What we observe uh, at Norpool is that some market participants trade without physical assets. Um, then they are forming their uh, expectation about supply and demand based on the market spread and the transactions of others instead of the physical output of their inputs. 
uh, we see that all the market participants arbitrage between uh, different products um, and then causing the price uh, to be set at the level far from the prevailing market prices. We also see that some market participants are doing the market making, having orders at both sides of the order book. Um, and they may change their level uh, uh, of their orders if, uh, if their, their expectation of fair price uh, changes. So what then, how to, how to uh, define what, what changes are artificial and, and what are not. And that is, uh, is um, difficult. And uh, I think we need even further guidance uh, on that. Um, um, when it comes to then the ACER, ACER guidance, I would really like to give a big thank you to ACER, uh, who provides very important guidance uh, to Remit, um, given the complexity and the vulnerability of our markets. Uh, it's extremely helpful to draft such an Euro pan-European uh, guidance. As it was also said, we do also have a case law uh, coming more and more, and some of the stakeholders are providing um, guidance as well. Um, the settled cases, as we saw here today, they provide much uh, needed details and concrete examples of the behavior that we can interpret as or see as market manipulation. But uh, as always, um, the devil is in the details, and uh, it's really important to, to, to look at the cases with the specificities of the market design and the de details of that exact case. So for example, uh, the case we just learned about is in the gas, gas market, and it's important to really interpret whether we can do or make the same assessments in the energy markets. And I also think, as a final remark, that the uh, regulatory authorities have uh, an important legal quest uh, to draw the line between uh, using uh, the existing market design to, to a maximum uh, versus abusing the market design at times when, uh, when the market design is not functioning perfectly. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Camilla. That was also extremely clear and some very good messages, uh, especially the last one. I think uh, indeed what happens when it's the market that's not functioning, the, mo the model isn't perhaps delivering on expectations. Um, so I'd like to turn now to our last panelist, um, who is also someone who has frequented a lot of our debates um, on some of these issues. Um, so Niels Hendrik, um, Please, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. Thank you for the invitation and for uh, participating in an uh, interesting discussion on an important and in <clears throat> interesting topic. I, I'm going to make essentially only one point, uh, namely that I think it's, it's useful to differentiate between market manipulation, as we heard about it here, and anti-competitive behavior in particular exercise of market power. And I think that the Spanish case brings that out uh, quite clearly. Um, if you look at the Rockwell trading case, um, it, it, it's, it really is more about behavior or conduct, um, how you operate in the market rather than about uh, price levels um, uh, as such. And to the extent that it is about uh, prices, it's about uh, deviations from prevailing or, uh, or what one, <clears throat> one might call normal prices. Um, <clears throat> there is no, uh, no discussion in the case, as far as I could see, about underlying costs or willingness to, to, uh, uh, to pay or anything like sort of market fundamentals. It's, it's all about whether uh, Rockwell trading um, offered uh, or bid prices that differed from those uh, that were <clears throat> that were uh, prevailing on the on the market um, and that makes uh, that case very different from a, a competitive uh, <clears throat> uh, competition policy case uh, or a case of anti-competitive conduct where 
the, the fundamental question is really whether prices deviate from, uh, from the underlying costs or willingness to pay. Admittedly, uh, and as uh, Martin pointed out, uh, costs uh, and in particular opportunity costs is a different concept, but, but really a competition case is, is to a very large extent about establishing whether prices deviate from, from underlying market fundamentals, whereas that, that is really not uh, the case in, uh, in the rock world <clears throat> trading case. Um, also, uh, if we look about the mechanism in uh, in this uh, in the rock world trading case, it's it's really about manipulating prices through beliefs, um, rather than by, for example, withholding output or setting non-competitive prices. It's it's posting or offering, making bids that are intended to influence the perceptions of the other market participants, and then through that influence the way they set prices uh, and then hopefully gain, gain from that. Um, <clears throat> so this, in my view, market manipulation is really about uh, the integrity and trust in marketplaces. People don't like to be fooled and they don't want to participate in the market where they risk meeting people who, who fool them. Um, <clears throat> and it's not, uh, about uh, about uh, the exercise of market power. In fact, there was, if anything, <clears throat> in the rock uh, world uh, trading case, uh, it, it to the extent that uh, market power was mentioned, it, it was more that um, the, the, the company, the, the trades of the company were rather small. And you could think of it in a, an extreme case, um, where prices are manipulated through placing rumors, for example, you don't need to have market power at all. In fact, you, could, you wouldn't even, uh, even have to participate in the market to affect uh, uh, prices there. So <clears throat> that also means that there is a, a difference between market manipulation in this sense and, uh, for example, capacity withholding. So uh, um, as I see it, uh, this... Um, the, the problem of market manipulation is really an issue for organized markets. And um, Norpool has been mentioned already, and other organized markets typically have rules about conduct, um, um, not only in the energy field, but in, in other markets as well, stock exchanges, financial markets more generally, typically have rules of conduct, and they they survey market behavior and they penalize participants who don't abide by the, by the rules. So um, um, <clears throat> it's not so much uh, an issue for the, the wider energy market as such. It's more to, to, for those who operate organized markets to ensure that people trust in them, are willing to use them, um, and so they operate efficiently. So, as I said, only one single point. There is... Uh, this, I think it's useful just to distinguish between market manipulation, as we've seen it in this Spanish case, and uh, anti-competitive behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, also for stressing and how important it is to get the, the fundamentals right. Um, and there are quite a few questions coming up through the chat. Um, but before we turn to... Uh, questions from the audience as well as questions from the panelists to the speakers and vice versa. Um, I'd like to start our polls. This is a standard feature of our debates um, where we um, ask the audience um, to participate um, in several polls. Unfortunately, uh, speakers and panelists don't have this uh, privilege. So, um, Chiara, would you like to run the first uh, question for us? Um, in the polls. Um, and uh, this concerns then a, a quote. In fact, I was inspired by a quote uh, from someone who um, is in the audience today, actually listening, I saw. And he was interviewed um, about uh, the future hydrogen market and whether we would need a remit like regulation uh, for that market once it develops. So um, we'd like to hear your views on whether or not the hydrogen market is likely to be an organized market uh, in the near future, which would need a remit like regulation. So would you agree with that statement, disagree, or is it perhaps too early to have an opinion? So the polls are open now. It's 
So majority agree, uh, although there are a few, quite a few who disagree and even more who are just waiting in wait and see mode. Thank you uh, very much. Um, so I'll turn now to the, the second question. And while um, Clara, Clara's got that now on the screen, um, I um, was interested in the recent um, Ofgem inquiry um, against um, alleged market manipulation on the part of the National Grid Company. Um, and um, there was an interesting um, comment by Ofgem, I think, which is very relevant in the context of our debates today, um, that it was very difficult for them to penalize um, National Grid for its behavior um, because it was very difficult um, to develop a sufficiently robust counterfactual scenario. Um, and um, what happened then uh, as a result was that uh, rather than imposing a penalty uh, on um, National Grid, Ofgem actually agreed um, to um, a settlement with a considerable amount of money, all the same. Um, now, of course, Ofgem is no longer part of uh, the um, network of regulators, but I think it's an interesting case. So my questions are, do you agree um, that it's very difficult um, to develop a sufficiently robust uh, counterfactual scenario um, when, as a regulator, uh, you're in the process of applying uh, quite substantial fines. And the second part of the question is, was the um, solution um, opted for here? So um, a settlement rather than a financial penalty, uh, do you think that was a good outcome? So again, um, yes or no uh, answers. So I invite you to answer both parts of this question. So that's very interesting. I think that uh, there's uh, quite a bit of skepticism about the possibility of um, robust counterfactuals here and um, that the settlement seemed to be um, the better alternative. Okay, thank you very much. I think this maybe also underlines a theme that's coming out through the discussions on the sort of case by case approach that's necessary. Okay, the final, the final polling question, I hope we haven't exhausted you, um, but this goes back um, also to Martin's presentation and the, and the recent guidance uh, that has been mentioned a few times today um, on the market manipulation um, test. Now, Acer, in fact, recommends two tests um, to um, assess whether behavior involving electricity generation capacity withholding amounts to a breach of remit. Uh, so first, we have to see whether the market participant is able to influence the price. Um, or the interplay of supply and demand. And the second is, um, is there no other reason? Is there perhaps no legitimate technical or regulatory justification for that behavior um, when it doesn't offer the available capacity or has offered it above marginal costs? I think echoing Camilla's last comment um, that it's sometimes market design that's problematic. So my question here is, do we need both tests um, and um, who should the mark, who should bear the burden of proof? Actually, uh, an issue coming through in the chat too. So, do we need both tests? Um, and um, should it be the regulatory authorities or the market participants who bear the burden of proof? Uh, or we don't need these tests at all as they're not helpful. Okay, so that was fairly quick. Uh, the majority then um, think that uh, the burden uh, of proof should be on the regulatory authorities. Well, thank you indeed for your, for your active participation. Um, so closing the polls now, and I think we still have um, half hour left for discussion. So I would like, first of all, to ask um, Martin if he'd like to comment on the poll results or on other, any other issue that has been raised by panelists? Martin, can you hear us? I think you're on, uh, you have to unmute. 
Can you unmute your yeah? Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear you now? Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I was really interrupted for a glitch, but I, I, I didn't pull out now. Um, so you asked me to comment on the poll results. When yes. you were doing the polls, I was brutally interrupted in my internet connection, which I don't know why, but the last one was a very mm -hmm. interesting poll. And I see that 70% of the audience in this call um, believe that we both of the test in the Asia guidance on the section 6421i test as a burden of proof sits with the national regulator. Um, I, 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 I would say that uh, that's a good result um, from, from your views, that at least the Asia guidance provides the guidance. And of course, it's up to the national regulator to come up with the uh, proof. Um, um, I'm not sure if you can still hear me because it seems to be unstable. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So uh, I, I think it's a good question also about whether the burden of proof should be with the national regulator or with a market participant. Um, from my perspective, I don't, I don't draw a view here personally. Uh, I mean, I, certainly, that's, a, that's, a, that's as ASA, I don't draw a view. We don't say much in that specific piece of guidance on that point. I, I find it it's very challenging for a national regulator, but that of course is not a legitimate argument to say that it should not be on the NRA to prove it. So um, it, it's challenging. Um, it, 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 there are pieces of the ASIC guidance where it says that the burden of proof is with the uh, undertaking to argue their case. And I, I must say from what I actually, um, something that when the behavior takes place of capacity withholding and it turns let's say monopolitive because it meets these two requirements, these two, two, two steps, then the NRA can, of course, request information from the market participant to argue what has happened and to add, argue all the questions. But I, can, I guess in the end of the day, uh, the prosecution uh, for the national regulator, even though the framework for prosecuting uh, remit cases at national level is different than member states, um, is, is with the national regulator. But um, so I, I, try, I try to answer a little bit the question, but it's, it's a complicated one. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Maybe we could turn to, um, to Guillermo in that context, uh, having um, seen the results of the polls, uh, perhaps some of the discussions been quite focused on, on electricity and you pointed out in your presentation uh, that uh, fines for manipulation in electricity markets are much higher. So um, from that point of departure, do you think then the, that last poll was, was a fair reflection on the need to make sure the regulators bear the burden of proof, um, given that they have this power to impose high fines, or you think market participants are adequately warned about what they should not be doing and should be able to prove that they've been actually obeying the rules. You're addressing the question to me, Lei? No, to Guillermo, if he's still okay, there. Okay, sorry. There. If he's still there. If he's not yet back online. Um, Fabian, would you like to comment on that? Because you talked quite a bit about um, the difficulties yeah. of counter arriving at decent counterfactuals too. Maybe I can say a few more words on that last part of the poll, which I mm. found very interesting. And just remind everybody that I think that Acer guidance um, is a, a very welcome, I would say, step forward and clarification. I was mentioning that typically several criteria need to be looked at. And, and I think Acer has really clarified that there are at least two steps. A uh, first step is the ability to influence the price. And then uh, the second step is, is obviously the investigation on, on how one can economically justify um, the price on offer. Uh, if we look at each one of these steps, I mean, typically, how does one uh, evaluate the ability to influence price? Well, 
there are some generic indicators such as you know uh, indicators of market shares uh half Hirschman index, you know, HHI, uh, but there are some more specific indicators. And this is also where power and gas are different. As, as you know, in power, we have, I would say, some indicators which are uh, taking into account the fact that electricity is a bit specific as a commodity, cannot be stored, and market power manifests itself um, in different ways. So, for instance, I mean, ACER refers to by volatility indicators as being uh, appropriate uh, as well for electricity. And I think that that's quite important. So we, we do have, I think, uh, uh, a significant step forward uh, with that guidance. Now, if I come to the second leg, so the second part of, of the criteria on the economic justification, I think what is also very important in the ESA guidance is that yes, market fundamentals and costs are important, but Acer also clarified that opportunity costs are important. And, and we've seen how that was key in a number of um, the cases we have had in, in case law. Uh, and, and I think uh, Acer is, is also suggesting, uh, and, and others as well, that bidding incentives induced by the market design features uh, are, are also uh, legitimate reasons uh, why why you may want to uh, to rationalize um, a bit. So so long story short, and, and perhaps to come back to the the poll, uh, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with everybody that this ASO guidance is a very important step forward. Um, and and I yeah I think that's important uh, in our future applications of uh, of remit. Thank you very much. I'm sure that's music to Martin's ears. Uh, he's put a lot of work in that guidance, I know. Um, Camille, can I ask you perhaps to reflect on any of the polls um, and the responses so far? Yes, uh, I think I just uh, adhere to what Martin uh, said. I think um, on the last uh, poll, um, uh, it it uh, it was uh, uh, yeah uh, as expected, and I, <laughs> I I agree with him that uh, or I hopefully expected, and uh, that it was uh, was uh, something um, that should be done. I would also again like to say that uh, we are very happy with the guidance that Acer is providing. We think it's extremely important. Um, for all stakeholders in the market, including uh, market surveillance teams. And we also hear that from uh, market participants that they, uh, they are really value these guidance from ACER. Thank you, thank you very much. And now turning to Niels Henrik. You have the last word again, Niels Henrik on the polls. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean I have to disagree, or can I agree with? Uh, well, whatever, <laughs> whatever you feel uh, is not market <laughs> manipulation or <laughs> panelist no, manipulation. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I think I, I agree that uh, ACA guidelines are very helpful, and and, uh, and there's a, a lot of work has gone into <clears throat> creating them, and uh, and uh, you can see that. I still think that it would be useful to be even to distinguish more clearly between different types of, of cases because they, they should really be treated uh, differently. And uh, in particular, what, what steps you need to go through is very, I mean, take an extreme example, placing a rumor um, <clears throat> um, is to, to, to challenge that. Uh, you don't really need to think very much about market fundamentals you need. You only need to check the content of the <clears throat> of the statement and whether it's true or not. Uh, at the other extreme, if you if you think about capacity bid holding, which uh, which Martin was talking about, you need a very careful uh, assessment of uh, of underlying uh, costs, uh, opportunity costs, and and so forth. Um, so I think maybe there is perhaps room for improvement uh, in distinguishing between different cases. 
Okay, thank you. And anyone perhaps like to venture on that, how um, to go about um, meeting that uh, request, room for improvement? There is a question in the chat, um, going back to Fabian's presentation. Um, and uh, this is from uh, Mathilde Brabant um, and asking if um, considering um, the final slide, I think I'm right, um, of conclusions presented by Fabian, she would like to know more about ACER's reaction. Are those acceptable parameters to define an, app, an opportunity cost um, in relation with the missing money by offering an asset on the day ahead market instead of keeping it on the intraday market without risking economical withholding. So that's why I think of a, a very pertinent question. Um, I don't know if uh, you, Martin would like to comment on it um, or if Fabian would like to comment on it. I'll ask Martin first if he wants to say anything about it, but uh, if not, um, maybe Fabian having raised the point, would like to reflect further on it? Yes, I, I'm happy to, to respond to this valid and good question. And I thank you very much also, Ms. Hendrik, to uh, point to the fact that you must really differ so that capacity withholding is merely one type of behavior that could render artificial prices. And you need to be very careful distinguishing costs. As I also uh, let's say, admitted in the presentation, it's a, it's a tricky concept. Uh, um, but what I try to do in my slide pack uh, on one of my slides, I explain and also in the ASIC guidance we do, we provide uh, an insight in how we then see opportunity costs. And also like uh, Fabien mentioned, example that is in guidance and also in slide, where indeed uh, the prices in, let's say, time frames after the time frame in which you bid for your capacity, let's say day ahead market you bid, then of course your expectations and the prices that will materialize in intraday um, and, and bouncing markets, they propagate back into the markets where you bid. So for me, it is very defendable that your opportunity cost factors in this propagation effect. So if you think that the balancing market will render very high prices, then it may reflect in your bid in the uh, day head or intraday market, provided that you are not in a decisive position to set the price in that market. If you are a person, you are, you are, you are in an indispensable situation for the, the term and what the price will be in this aftermarket, let's say balancing market, then it's not an opportunity cost come from a rule to dictate the price. So the opportunity cost is therefore a difficult concept uh, to apply here, but I would say that yes, uh, this is absolutely uh, what is meant in the ASA guidance. That is my brief comment on this one. Thank you very much. I think uh, that was a, an excellent brief comment. Uh, Niels Hendry, would you like to comment on the brief comment, with a brief comment? No, I think Martin's comment made sense. Okay, that was brief. Thank you, Fabian. Have you uh, any further reflections there? No, I think we uh, we all agree on that point. Um, and, and I can only uh, second what Martin said, so the deal is in the details. So obviously, <laughs> looking looking into the specifics of opportunity costs is uh, one one of the challenging tasks for uh, for economists like us. Um, and you really have to uh, have an in depth understanding um, of of you know the market design, the specifics, so that you you give an accurate picture of of these opportunity costs and what is legitimate and what is not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of questions coming in through the chat. Um, um, Peter Willis, um, a well-known a well -known participant in remit debates, um, asks about um, reflecting on a more accurate uh, interpretation of the remit prohibitions. Um, so would it be better, he is asking, um, 
to interpret remit as prohibiting securing a price through artificial conduct, uh, which seems to secure the essence of the ACER guidance rather than secure a price at an artificial level, which just raises further questions. So I think, well, if I'm correct, Peter is saying maybe, you know, artificial conduct that has as a term might have more similarities um, with what we are familiar with as, as antitrust lawyers, where your conduct is somehow um, as, as a market player um, intended uh, to have certain effects. Would that be, would that be clearer uh, for all concerned? Would that be a better way of approaching uh, the issue? Um, Camila, would you like to reflect on that? Um, again, it goes back to, I think, the point you made at the end of your intervention. Um, you know, when, are you, when, you're, when is your conduct really to be explained more because of the problems with market design rather than any intentional manipulative behavior on your, effect, on your part? Would this be a useful way forward? Would this be a recommendation that... Uh, we should put to um, review of the remit regulation the next time it comes up. I don't know if Camila, oh, here she is coming now, I think. I think there's some interference. Oh, no. Okay. Maybe while we're waiting for Camilla, if she has some problems, we are lucky now to have um, Guillermo back online. I think he was there a minute ago, at least. So, um, so there have been quite a few questions um, on uh, the RT case, quite specific questions. Um, and maybe just to, to pick up on one um, of those questions. Well, perhaps actually it would be fairer given that you were not able to follow all the discussion, uh, Guido Would you like to point to any one of those questions that you would like to answer? Yes, I'm sorry because I don't know, but I think I had problems with my line or with my computer, I don't know. Yes, I have seen some of the questions. Uh, I don't know, Lee, if you refer to the questions of the chat. Yes. Uh, okay, one of this is why the CMC has chosen a fine low in the range of penalties. I think, uh, okay, and the resolution say that there are two main reasons uh, that are explained in the resolutions. First one is the, that the impact on the market was uh, is insignificant because uh, rock trading trade with very low volumes. And the, the second reason is because uh, rock trading had just started to participate in the market. I think that uh, there is no sense to impose an, an, a, a very a, a higher penalty in this case. Thank you. Um, so there's, it's almost, you could say, there's no de minimis rule here, even if you had a very insignificant effect on the prices, you could still be liable uh, for, yeah, for a relatively small fine. It's still quite a lot of money, but uh, yeah. given the potential um, plat, yeah, ceiling on the uh, fine that could have been imposed, that's probably one of the explanations. Um, is Camilla back on board yet? No, nope. don't think so. Um, Okay, maybe turning uh, then in uh, back to the question uh, on how to define then um, artificial conduct. Um, Fabian, would you like to comment on um, the suggestion made by Peter Willis? Yes, and um, well, hi, Peter. Uh, and uh, just to say, uh, I think I'll repeat what um, Niels Henrik said. I think Niels Henrik had a very nice um, analysis where he said, look, we should um, distinguish uh, competition policy where the focus is, is very much uh, on, you know, the costs, willingness to pay, essentially comparing prices and, and market fundamentals. 
from, from what we are doing here and, and considering manipulation of the market in the sense of uh, really conduct rather than, than in the sense of, of what we have typically in, in competition policy. So I, I can only second what, what Peter said and, and, and also uh, what, what Neil Sandrick said on, on that front. Thank you very much. It's always good when we're all in agreement. <laughs> um, okay, um, Alberto, I think we're reaching the end um, of today's very fascinating event. I wondered if you had a question that you might like to pose. Um, no, I, I don't have a question. I have a comment, perhaps, um, which I will try to share with you. Because looking at poll number two, the results of the second and third poll, the third poll clearly endorses ACER's um, two tests, but said that the burden of proof should be on, on the regulators. And then the second poll said it's basically very difficult to find a counterfactual. And I guess a counterfactual is almost always needed for, for, for proving something. You know, the, the market would have gone differently if the behavior would have not taken place, except for what uh, Neil Henry um, said beforehand, you know, that if you spread rumors, you don't need to have a counterfactual. But uh, so it seems to me that what comes out of, uh, you know, of the feedback from the polls is almost an impossible scenario for enforcement. You know, the regulator should have the, should prove, but they find it difficult to, to, to come up with, a, with, 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 the, with the evidence because the counterfactual is difficult to determine. So is this, I mean, maybe it's a too simplistic a conclusion, but is this what is coming out from, from part of the discussion today beyond sort of you know, determining what is an artificial price and what is not? Because Remit was about avoiding market abuse um, and market manipulation, and also not only avoiding, but also deterring. But then if the conclusion is that the regulator would find it very difficult to enforce, then I think we're back to square one so sometime, somehow. So I wonder whether in the last two or three minutes before we, we close, anybody could prove me wrong and say, no, no, you've missed something very important. And this is too simplistic, too simplistic a conclusion. Maybe just to add to that, a, um, a comment from the chat, which I think um, illustrates the problems uh, perhaps facing regulators. And that's uh, from um, Michiel, who is asking uh, about the change to the guidance uh, and the role of intent. So not, not only should regulators uh, establish the, the counterfactual, but about intent as well. And is there a reason uh, that uh, intent uh, has to be assessed? Is that, you know, has that disappeared from the guidance because it's too complex? So if we can throw that into the mix in the last two minutes, I don't know if anybody wants to venture into uh, a reflection on Alberto's conclusion with the added spice of the change to the guidance in 2019, or if we can conclude, well, uh, room for even more debate in the future. So yep. I think, I think every, that's probably better. Yeah, everybody welcoming the new guidance and I think congratulating Acer for producing a very, very important and useful product uh, for market participants, um, but still, a lot of uh, yeah issues to to be debated and and discussed as to uh, how regulators at national level should proceed. So something to follow up in a future debate. Um, and I'd like to thank all um, the speakers and participants. I'm sorry there's been a few technical problems, um, but I think uh, we've been all able to enjoy really an, an excellent, very high quality debate today. Um, so again, thank you very much, all of you, also to all the participants for very active chat and Q&A session. Um, and I'll turn the floor over to Alberto just to, uh, for a final message to thank also my colleagues here at Foreign School of Regulation. Yep. Uh, well, Lee, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all of you. Um, this is indeed has been quite an interesting debate. It's not the end of the story. Um, it will not. It's not. It has not been the first time we looked at Remit. Uh, it won't be the last time. Uh, this is actually now the last of our debate for this academic year. I would like to thank all of those who have participated in the various um, uh, events. Uh, we will resume in September. We still have not finalised the 
the agenda, but most likely Lee and I have been talking about um, the topics for probably the first two debates of our series, and one might be on gender equality and diversity in the energy transition, and the second one might be on the duty of care um, um, and how, you know, uh, who should have the duty of care in, again, in the energy transition more generally. In, uh, in, 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 in towards carbon neutrality. So, but we will have to elaborate the two concepts. Uh, you will hear from us. Uh, um, thank you very much for your loyalty. And uh, above all, we can't, I can't forget Chiara, Chiara in the background. Uh, she's been with us the whole season. Uh, so thank you very much, Chiara. It's now time to enjoy the summer and uh, to all of you, um, all the best, health, and uh, enjoyment during the summer. And we'll we be back on the debate series in September. So thanks a lot. And just to mention quickly, we will, uh, thanks to um, our new colleague, uh, Max Munchmeyer, who was also on today, we will be producing uh, highlights of this debate um, for you, as well as, uh, of course, the recording.